Uh, hi, welcome. Um, hello, London. I am very happy to be here. It's uh, a bit overwhelming how full this room is and how please don't trample over yourselves. Um, I, the, you're going to see a few pictures in the slides that look m less terrible than all the stock pictures that I stole from the internet. Um, I'm trying to do this thing where when I give a talk somewhere, I go around the place and take some pictures of where I am just to make every talk a bit of a time capsule where I gave it first. Um, there we go. Who am I? If you don't know who I am, um, I like taking pictures, obviously. Uh, that was the wrong direction. What is happening? Actually, I think, I think maybe this thing doesn't know how to handle my two-dimensional slide grid. <laughs> so, that's a bit unfortunate. Uh, my name is Katerina Fay, as you already said. I, have been, uh, I work in distributed systems for some definition of that term. Um, I've been working with Rust since about 2017. I got pretty intensively into it in the beginning. I worked on the 2018 edition. I've been maintaining a bunch of crates. Um, in recent times, I haven't been super active in the community, but it's still a language that's really, really important to me, and it's still a community that's really important to me. So it's very, very nice to be here, and it's my first conference in person since um, the year that we all don't speak about. Um, so, I say some definition of the term distributed systems. I say that because, why am I still holding this? It's going to be dangerous. Um, I say that because, depending on who you ask and what sort of context they work in, distributed system systems can mean uh, a few different things. Um, so, I, I work on this research project, uh, which is funded by the EU uh, software R&D uh, funding thing called Erdist. Um, I don't really want to talk about it here just because otherwise we'll still be here in three hours. Um, I like building async runtimes, which is sort of a, a flip side to this. I really like thinking about distributed data problems and the the problems you run into by having more than one thing doing a thing and then synchronizing wherever it makes sense to synchronize so that you don't lose any data. Um, we did a, I did a, uh, an async workshop yesterday for anyone who was there. Actually, I recognize a few people who were there. Um, I do NixOS uh, things if, you, if you're into that sort of stuff. Uh, and I'm a contractor, as I already said, so you can hire me for contracts and trainings and more on that later. Um, if I go to, if there's something that I don't cover in the Q&A later, or you don't run into me at the conference, or you're seeing this online, uh, please feel free to email me, or for the five other queer people who still use XMPP, it's there. Um, uh, I'm not so much on IRC anymore, so expect like two months delay. Also, actually, I read my emails every, every day, but I um, have about four months of reply delay currently. Anyway, enough self-tooting. Oh, right, you can follow me on Mastodon if you're there. Cool. So this talk is called Beyond Arc Mutex um, and of T. The T is often silent. Um, and that might make you ask the question, what is an arc? And uh, maybe more importantly, what is a mutex? And you are officially allowed not to care about what T is. Um, this is the question that I would really like to talk about for ages, um, but I'm not going to. Um, it's, it's a lot about models and how you think about the data that you're working with, thinking about how you access that data. Um, and so maybe this is a question that you can have at the back of your mind, um, but yeah, just this is, this is the sort of space that we're operating in here. Um, so before we get into the crux of it, though, I'd like to define some terms because I think that's important. Um, and there's also two terms that I have personally misused in the past, and I see people misuse on the internet all the time, and it's very difficult to not correct them. Um, so the two terms that I'm talking about are concurrency and parallelism. Um, they're very similar, but they're not the same thing. Um, and to understand where they come from and the differences between them, we need to go and travel back in time to a day where this computer would have been called current gen. So pretty early on, when building large computer systems, it became obvious that I.O. is a very is, is a bottleneck. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time putting those reels in that machine, and you're going to do the punch card thing. I've never worked with a punch card computer. I've, I'm young. Um, but I've been told it's, it was a very I.O. intensive task. Um, and so very early on, operating systems were developed to um, help with this. So instead of having a computer run one program 100% all the time and then waiting while another program was being loaded, 
you load a bunch of programs into memory and then uh, run them concurrently by time slicing the available CPU time that you have. And so when one program was already done, you still had other work to execute while you could do I.O. in the background or, you know, your minions uh, put I.O. into the computer. And so the computer was more heavily used and you didn't waste as many CPU cycles, which in those days, and to be honest, still today, is a big deal because computers are expensive, even though people think they're not. Um, so concurrency means, the, the act of, of, of working concurrently means that you split up some task, which could be your program, or it could be a collection of program, uh, or just your entire uh, academic research field into units of work. Whatever that unit of work is, it doesn't really matter, and it depends on what abstraction level you're thinking about. Um, if you're doing async development, for example, a unit of work would be a future. If you're not doing async development, maybe a unit of work would be a thread. Um, so you split up your task into smaller units of work, and then you pause and resume those units of work very quickly uh, to give the illusion of running at the same time, because humans are generally not very good at realizing when we're being tricked into uh, accepting something as smooth motion when it is, in fact, still images. The, um, the flip side to this is parallelism, where uh, you basically throw more silicon at it. Instead of having a single core that executes a bunch of stuff, you add more cores, and then those cores can still execute units of work. You still have to do that work up front to split up your program in a way that is logically consistent and makes sense, and you end up with the correct result in the end, but they can actually run at the same time. So, not super relevant, or not immediately relevant for what we're going to talk about, but just, again, something that um, I, I have gotten wrong, you might have gotten wrong, so uh, you're welcome. Um, anyway, so let's think about why data synchronization in the first place. And I promise I'm not going to talk about data models, and I'm not going to talk about mental models of your program, even though I, again, would really like to. Um, instead, I would really like you to consider a computer. Maybe not exactly that computer. Let's maybe go a little bit further into it um, and think about what is a computer made of. Well, we have here in this model of a computer, which is very simplistic, and I see a few different problems with it already, but we have a CPU, uh, which can execute some kind of code, uh, and we have different threads in that CPU, and each of the thread cores, whatever you want to call them, has cache. And then, at the same time, we have memory, which here, it could be the, the actual system memory, or um, this could be your level three cache, which is shared across all the CPU cores. Uh, we, I'm going to talk briefly about cache coherency protocols later, but um, it's not relevant here. So let's say uh, we have that four there in memory, and we would, like that really, uh, we would really like that to be a five. So what do we do? Well, um, first of all, uh, we load that value from memory or from cache into a more local cache of one of the cores that we're working with. Um, and then that CPU core can increment that number. 4 plus 1 is 5. And then we store that number back. Um, and then the end result that we have is we have 5 in memory. And I know you're all going crazy. 4 plus 1 is 5. I'm really glad that we have computers to solve these fundamental questions of the universe. Let's add another thread. Right? So we want to do concurrent programming. Um, let's add another thread. What could possibly go wrong? So um, we, again, we have two threads active now, the top right and bottom left one, or cores or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, and both of them load the value into memory. And you can already see where this is going. Both of them add one to it, because we would like it to be plus one. And then we store five back. But Unlike previously, now we have a data race where f five is not the correct answer. We were expecting it to be probably six. I mean, if you were building something that runs in lockstep and then you have two things that compare notes with each other, you might want to do something else here, but this is clearly the wrong, the wrong thing to do. Um, and this is one of the many, many concurrency and parallelism problems that you can run into where something overtakes something or something runs at a slightly inconvenient time and then you get something like that. And that in production is very fun. So what we really would like to do is limit, um, limit 
access to our memory to one thread at a time. Uh, and this is called the critical section. And uh, the basic mechanism to implement something like this is called a mutex. Now, I know that the, the talk is beyond arc mutex of T, but let's maybe discuss how a mutex works first. So in the same uh, principle, in the same scenario here, we have now four in memory, and we have this other flag there, which is false for now. Um, and also, the, the, the pictures here, I was a little bit lazy, so you have to imagine, when we, when we set this to true, what we're really doing first is we need to check if it's already locked, and if it's not, then we lock it. And yes, clever people in the audience will already see the problem with exactly what I'm doing here, but just to sort of demonstrate the principle. So instead of having two threads race for a resource, um, have a thread check the mutex state before it tries to do something, and if it's not allowed to do it, then it doesn't do it um, and waits. Um, and so at the same time, you know, you, we load the four, we plus one it, and we put the five back, and then we finally unlock the mutex again, or lock the mutex. I always get those two confused. And then finally the second thread can do the same thing, and it decides, you know what, I don't want to do plus one, uh, I'll, I'll just put 42 in there, why not? And then it locks it again. And so now what we've done is we've been interleaving the work that we want to do across two threads, based on this uh, mutex. Um, but, so, uh, some of you might already be asking yourselves, haven't we just moved the problem? Haven't we just made it uh, a race condition where two threads will take the mutex state and say, well, pff, it's not locked, and then put true back, but two threads have just put true back, and now we get another race condition because our mutex wasn't actually thread safe. So this is where I want to talk about the mutual exclusion principle. Um, this is a general problem that can be solved, and it has a few uh, general answers. Um, and I want, to, I want to demonstrate one here. I promise not to turn this into a computer science lecture. And also, if the next example seems extremely contrived, it's not my fault. I took it from this book, which I generally recommend. And there's another book recommendation at the end of this talk. So. We have, oh yeah, and in the speaker notes, there's a PDF link. Um, I'll upload it somewhere. It's not public yet. Um, so we have Alice and Bob, uh, and they're neighbors, and they both have pets. Alice has a cat, and Bob has a, has a dog. And they share a yard, um, and they would really both like their pets to be able to play in the yard, but because cats and dogs obviously don't get along for some reason, um, they can't be in the yard at the same time, because otherwise they get bruises and it gets really expensive in the, in, at the vet. Um, so what they do is they figure out this, this mechanism where they signal to each other whether they're currently using the yard. And they do this with the flag principle. So Alice, uh, who you can ask about RSA, by the way, if you want, um, raises her flag, um, and then she checks whether Bob has already raised his flag. And if that's not the case, Alice is now raising her flag, Bob has not raised his flag, and so the cat is allowed to go in the yard. What we want is that only either the cat or the dog can be in the yard at the same time. And if we don't, we get some horrible, horrible issues. So we really want to avoid that. So if the cat is already in the yard, how does the dog, how does Bob, get access to the yard? Well, that's a bit more complicated. And it also works in reverse. So if Bob has already got his flag up and Alice wants to go into the yard, she does the same thing here. And basically, Bob is in a loop of some sorts and raises his flag because we always, we always signal our, our own property first so that when someone is reading us, we've already signaled if, so to, to get rid of the race condition, essentially, where um, you would read and then you would put the thing up because then you can both read a zero and then both have a one. So if you put the one first, if you raise your flag first and then check the other person's flag, then if... If, there, if it happens at exactly the same time, you will both see that the flag is raised and you both lower it, and then there's algorithms to determine who goes first. You can do a little bit of delay. It's a research field that's existed for 40 years. I'm not going to summarize it here. But, so Bob raises his flag and then checks for the flag state of Alice, who still has her flag up, and so Bob lowers his flag again and tries again later. At some point in the future, when the cat is no longer in the yard, Alice lowers her flag. And then, again, at some point in the future, maybe when, when uh, Bob enters the next uh, cycle of his busy loop or he's being interrupted by something, he raises his flag again, checks for Alice's flag status, 
Alice has her flag down, and so finally the dog can be in the yard. So Alice has to wait. Uh, oh, if Alice wanted to, no. If Alice wanted to now go into the yard again, she does exactly the same thing as Bob here. She has to raise her flag, check, etc., 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 and she has to wait. So. This is how mutexes have worked for a very long time. Um, and uh, there's, a, as I said, multiple algorithms how to do this. This obviously only works for two people. There's generalizations of this. Um, uh, for example, Peterson's algorithms and Lampert's bakery algorithms. There's, there's several algorithms, actually, that are called some, someone's bakery algorithm. I don't know what that's about. I don't know why. But there is, um, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do this. On modern systems, though, we don't have to do this anymore because we have some new tools, atomics. So, atomics are a bit magic, um, and I, I'm going to gloss over some things here. I, I have to, otherwise we're going to not have enough time. So, atomics are hardware operations that are supported by pretty much every modern CPU architecture. Um, x86 has them, ARM has them, Spark has them, PowerPC has them at the later revisions. And, you know, probably your favorite instruction set, unless you're really into, like, vintage hardware and retro computing, probably has atomic instructions. What it means to do an atomic instruction is to synchronize memory between writers and readers, so that when you place a value into a memory location that is atomic, only you are allowed to touch it at that time, and you're guaranteed to not get a data race. You're, not, you're guaranteed to not get a partial read or a partial write. And also, if you're trying to write something, we would really like to know if someone else beat us to it, and we made a write based on false assumptions. And um, yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of different uh, uh, mechanisms that are at play here. At the CPU level, we need to synchronize the caches between the different CPU cores, uh, and this is where cache coherency protocols come in. Again, this is a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, a very simple cache coherency protocol, well, simple for cache coherency protocol, is MESI, um, which stands for Modified, Exclusive, Shared, and Invalid. You might see some hints of what Rust's memory model is there in the cache coherency protocol, because we have, to, we have to make sure that only one thing is able to have immutable reference to our memory location in the cache at the same time. Um, the cache coherency protocols that are actually used by CPUs are more uh, complicated and um, usually have more, more states. For example, you can have um, an owned state and you have... Um, I forgot, there was another state type that you can have. Um, again, there's different drawbacks to this and considerations that you have to make. I've never built a CPU. I'm sure if you're a CPU builder, there's tons of things that you could say here. But um, yeah, I'm just going to move on. So um, I felt like this after doing the research for this talk. Um, I'm going to summarize this principle or this operation just with this sing single slide where the yellow box and arrow is an atomic operation, and we can just say, hey, make this be five, and the second thread that would have wanted to access the memory location at the same time has to wait. So what atomic operations are there? Um, and this is where I'm actually going to show you some Rust code. It's only 20 minutes in. Um, so, we can load the value. That's, I think, a very important operation. So, what we do here is, we, in the Rust code, we have an atomic U size, um, we set it to 42, and then we would like to actually load that value, because something else might have possibly changed that value in the meantime. We need to actually check, we need to actually actively load it every single time that we access that memory. Ignore what the ordering means for now, I'm going to cover that in about three minutes, badly. Um, so. What we get then here is probably 42. It might have changed, and this is why we actually have to load the value, but it's probably going to be 42. And uh, you're guaranteed not to have a partial read. So um, you're, you're not going to read partial memory that was written by 50% you know, of one thread and 50% of the other thread. You're guaranteed to have a coherent value that you get back. Um, the next set of... Um, the, the next set of, of, of functions are called fetch, and then there's a few different variants of them. For example, fetch add, fetch sub, fetch mul, fetch div, fetch and for logical operations. Um, and there's also in the Rust standard library fetch update, uh, which you can give a closure, and then it tries to... All right. 
Um, it tries to uh, load the value, puts it in your closure. You can do some logic about, is this the value that I was expecting? Do I really want this in there, etc.? You basically get access to the memory location. And then it tries to commit that memory, and it will fail if in your closure, in while between getting it and then you do your stuff and then you write it back, if someone else beat you to it, the operation is going to fail. Um, but yeah, again, so basically here, if we have an atomic value um, and we put 42 in it and then we do fetch and with one and then we load it again, then we get 43. Again, ignore the ordering. Um, and uh, the fetch operations also return the previous value. So if you wanted to know what you actually just overrode, you can get it that way. You can also throw it away if you don't care. Uh, this is where my slides went a bit funky. Um, the next operation that's really important is compare exchange. It was formerly called compare and swap, um, which has been deprecated because its API was a little bit funky. Um, but compare exchange is basically a generalized version of what I just showed you. And in fact, the um, uh, fetch update function in the Rust standard library is implemented via uh, a compare exchange uh, loop uh, underneath because it can't fail, it is going to retry again and again until it actually works. So compare exchange takes uh, four values. Um, the first one is the previous version of your data. So if you uh, have this, we have this atomic pointer, and uh, it's five, it's a, it's a mutable five, and now we want to exchange it, we want to exchange it for a mutable 10. Well, Compare Exchange needs to know that we actually know what's in there and nothing has beat us to it in the meantime. Um, and then we also provided the other pointer. The two orderings here, the first one is for when it succeeds and the second one is for when it fails. And I'm not going to explain the difference between those two because time travel is involved at the CPU level. Um, now, what are the orderings? Um, I don't want to beat around the bush too long. Uh, the orderings are responsible for telling the CPU and compiler how they are allowed to reorder your code. Compilers uh, love reordering code, and CPUs love running things out of order just so much they can't help themselves. It just makes them so much faster. Um, and so what that means is that if you don't enforce a particular ordering in your memory access, you're going to get wildly different results based on the orderings that you choose. So, what ordering are there? What ordering uh, sort of levels are there? Well, I've used relaxed in all of these slides so far, um, which actually on my computer um, is uh, the same as acquire and release because I have an, an, an x86 machine, and on x86, at least an x86-64, the weakest memory order guarantee that you are given is acquire release. Um, you can always go into something that's stronger, but you can't go weaker. And that's not the case on different platforms, um, uh, on different CPU architectures. So it depends on your CPU architecture. Um, relaxed, basically, I I'm going to, uh, yeah, so acquire release, ACREL, which is pronounced acquire release, which is both, and I'm going to get what that means. And se sex, I don't know how to pronounce the abbreviation, it's sequentially consistent. Um, so what is relaxed? Relaxed ordering means yeah, you do not care. Um, so, uh, I really wanted to make some nice visualizations here, but unfortunately I ran out of time. Um, so what that means is that if we have these values, x, y, r1, and r2, and we have two branches that execute r1, uh, assign y to r1, and then assign r1 to x, and we assign x to r2 uh, and r2 to y, the compiler and the CPU are both allowed to reorder these however they see fit. They could take both the assignments to R2 first and then run the other ones, or they could just shuffle them completely or run them in the reverse order. It doesn't matter. You have not given it an ordering. You've not told it that you care about the order that these operations run in, and so the compiler is going to well, say, probably it doesn't matter then. Usually it doesn't matter. So what is acquire release? Um, as I already said, it's the default, um, according to the specification that I read, the default on x86. I haven't checked in my CPU. Um, you can always go stricter. Um, let's start with release. So release means that when you store something, it's only relevant when you store something. When you store a value, all previous loads before all loads before a previous acquire of the same value are guaranteed to be observable. What does that mean? Well, if you have an acquire first and then a release, then you are guaranteed that your release is going to see everything that happened in the 
previous iteration of that critical section. I think thinking about it like a critical section is helpful, even if it's not 100% accurate, um, and especially you need to consider this for every memory location separately. So every memory location has a critical section, and based on your orderings between acquire and release, you're guaranteed that the next iteration of that critical section is going to see whatever the previous critical section did. I hope that explains something to someone. Um, acquire, as you might guess then, is the inverse of this, so it starts the critical section. So it means that when loading a value, any store with release ordering um, is before this load is guaranteed to be observable by that load. So again, the critical section of the previous iteration of our, for example, loop, um, when you lock a mutex or something like that, is going to be guaranteed to be observable by the load. Now, the reason I say observable is that uh, CPUs are very complicated. Um, so instead of just having some cores and some cache and some shared cache and some more ca shared cache, um, you also have write buffers. Um, and especially with atomic operations, which are, tend to be quite slow because you have to synchronize a bunch of caches afterwards, writes tend to just go into a local write buffer first. And so the memory ordering is also relevant for deciding when you actually flush that write buffer to your cache because a core might do a bunch of operations and just to make it much faster, they put them in a local cache and then the next time um, you, get a, you get a release order, like a release ordering operation, then it's going to flush a bunch of operations into cache and make them available to whoever is interested in them. Um, acquire release is a combination of those two. So for example, if you're doing a compare exchange, um, you need to read something first and then write something back. And so to create a critical section within a single operation of sorts, uh, which is implemented at the hardware level, but you still have to give it an ordering guarantee, um, you can use acquire release to make sure that the, both the load and the store of, the, uh, of this compare exchange becomes the critical section. Um, and so that the next compare exchange is going to see what your previous compare exchange did. Um, there's some more nuance around this with whether a compare exchange uh, succeeds or fails. Um, so basically meaning that if it fails, then you, uh, you are okay with not having observed technically the previous rights. I'm gonna be honest, I read that part in the specification probably 20 times, and I think I understand what it means, but I'm not super sure. Uh, so when you, do, when you do a compare exchange, uh, generally it's uh, what I've seen other people do and what I've sort of hinted at from reading documentation is that it's okay to do a relaxed ordering because your operation failed anyway and you're going to try it again anyway. Finally, there is uh, sequentially consistent, which is the harshest and uh, strictest ordering guarantee that you can ask for. And it means that basically none of your sequentially consistent memory calls, uh, atomic operations, are allowed to be reordered at all. It's not even just in reference to a single memory location, it's globally in your program. So what you're saying is saying to the compiler and saying to the CPU is that the sequential order of operations as they are coming into your CPU, there's obviously still the possibility that multiple threads are scheduled at different times, and so the order sort of drifts a little bit, but the CPU is not going to try to reorder anything, and this compiler is not going to try to reorder anything in reference to every other sequentially consistent operation in your program. And so you're essentially creating this global order of all the different sequentially consistent operations in reference to each other. Again, I hope that explained something to someone. Um, I really recommend this uh, two and a half hour live stream uh, if you're interested <laughs> in <laughs> learning more. Um, I watched it about two and a half times, um, just to once to sort of check my own assumptions and then twice by taking notes. And I have some notes that I do not understand anymore. Um, so if any of what I just said seemed a little bit glossing over it, check this out. Uh, it's, it's very good. Watch it in chunks. Um, okay, so 
Um, I want to talk about another problem that you get with atomic operations, which is called, I'll let you take pictures, um, it's called the ABA problem. So you might have noticed that when we, yeah, unfortunately it doesn't have anything to do with ABBA. Um, I don't think ABBA has any problems, to be honest. Um, so when you, when you have a compare exchange and you uh, compare the previous value with some assumption that you hold uh, onto as a reference, what if a thread changes the value and then changes it back really quickly before you notice? And so you go to the value and say, this is my assumption. And technically, you're correct. That's what the value says. But in the meantime, it had some completely different value. And based on that completely different value that you didn't observe, maybe something happened in your system that you don't want to happen or didn't want to happen. And it's, uh, this is a very vague problem, uh, and it, I, I don't think it's very common to have, but it is still something that can happen. Funnily enough, it's not something that can happen on ARM, uh, because ARM doesn't have a single compare exchange operation, it has two operations. It says, taking ownership of, taking exclusive ownership of some kind of memory location, and then just storing based on the ownership that you already have. And any other thread, any other thing in your system is allowed to also take exclusive ownership away from you. And then when that has happened, when you store back, your operation is going to fail. So what does that mean for the ABA problem? Um, ARM is not the only one that does this. Um, I don't know, if the, know it off the top of my head. It's either Spark or PowerPC that does the same thing, but, uh, or like Power9. Um, but what that means is that if you have a thread that expects it to be value A, and then you have a thread that puts in value B. It already took ownership away from us. And then another thread, or maybe the same thread, puts in A again, but we still lost our access to it. And so the operation that when we put in, well, it's supposed to be A and we put in C, is going to fail because we lost access, we, we lost the exclusive flag, essentially. Okay, so uh, that was about 35 minutes of computer science. Let's do some Rust. This is a Rust conference. So I want to bring it back to how do you actually use this? Beyond, obviously, there's very low-level atomic operations that you can use. Um, and what you can actually do with them, I'm going to cover in a little bit as well. So first of all, you should understand what an arc is if you didn't before. It's an atomic reference counter. So every single time we put something in it, and t is a generic value, we put something in the arc, and every time we clone that arc, we're going to increment the atomic counter inside the arc. It's reference counting, but thread safe. Um, and so uh, it's a smart pointer that deallocates memory when no one can still read it anymore, which means that once all your threads have gone out of bounds or you dropped a bunch of values, then it'll finally be uh, cleaned up. This, by the way, is a great way to leak memory in um, runtimes uh, if you have something that holds onto arcs for some reason. And then suddenly, your web server uses 100 gigabytes of memory, and you're not really sure why. It turns out you were never cleaning up any requests. Um, so uh, that's obviously something that can happen with this. It's sort of dynamic memory management in Rust. Um, uh, what's a mutex then? Well, a mutex, again, is going to use an atomic variable inside of it, a, an atomic boolean, um, to uh, make sure that only one, uh, one thread or task or whatever you want to call them has access to the critical section at the same time. And so the example that I showed earlier where we have this race condition where we need to read the state of the, uh, of the, of the mutex and then put it back and something could happen in between, no, it can't, because what could happen is that two threads try to lock the mutex at the same time. One of them is going to get precedent based on something. Uh, it could be a butterfly flapping its wings like in a different country. Um, at, there's going to be some difference between them. One of the compare and swap operations or compare exchange operations is going to fail. And so um, then only one thread has access to the critical section. For the other one, it has failed, and so it has to wait. Um, you usually do like some kind of loop. There's different ways of building mutexes. It's complicated. You shouldn't spin lock um, because that's bad for your CPU time. Um, but yeah, so generally, uh, the, the mutex is atomic in, internally. There's ways to use the operating system, which done, th then does atomics for you, etc. So this pattern. What does it actually do then? Well, the mutex means that we can get a mutable reference to something from 
an immutable reference, but only ever one at the same time. And the arc means that we can refer to the mutex from multiple threads. And so this pattern, it's four, uh, 38 minutes in, and I finally explained the title of the talk. Um, this pattern means that you can take some kind of value and spread it all over your program, put it in different threads, put it in your data structures, whatever. And wherever it is being referenced, you can still get immutable access to the underlying value. And also, if all of those arcs go out of scope, the underlying value, the mutex, and then whatever is inside the mutex is going to be cleaned up. Um, and yeah, so there's this lock function. Um, and what you get back from it is a mutex guard, which is deref, uh, derefable. Um, and so you can still push something in onto it. And then when you drop the mutex guard, you relock. Uh, the mutex or unlock the mutex. It depends on how you think about it, whether it should be lock or unlock. Um, the, there's an alternative to this. The mutex is sort of very harsh. It only really allows one access at a time. What if we're all just reading? What if we have something that writes occasionally and then we have lots of readers? And that's, the, that's under, underpinning the, the Rust borrow model where you can have uh, as many read borrows as you want but only one write borrow. And so the smart pointer variant of that is the read write lock where you can see we have three readers here, R1, R2, R3, and so we can read multiple times, we can access that memory location read only as many times as we want, um, but when we want to write to it, we have to call the write function. The write function is going to fail, or block in this case, until no readers exist and until no other writer exists. Um, and similarly, a read function is going to fail if there is currently a writer writing to it. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not dropping any of my read handles here because the slide got too uh, small. Cool. So those are some very um, sledgehammer solutions to locking your data because you have, um, say, some kind of data structure inside it and no more than one access at a time is allowed in that data structure. What if we wanted to have some kind of concurrent access and we have some kind of schema where we can uh, pre-filter our requests? Well, that is absolutely possible. Uh, no one forces you to use a mutex as your global lock, and in fact, you probably shouldn't. So what this example is, is you have a tree or some kind of map, um, and you have two different types of indices. One is a super index, which is maybe um, a prefix to your index. You sort of pre-filter. If you're looking at UUIDs, you could sort of look at just the first n characters and then sort of uh, partition all of that data into subsections, and then that actual subsection is locked. So you do a read, you, you do a, an immutable access, and this would obviously, the B-tree map would still have to be in an arc, otherwise you can't refer to it from multiple places. But you do a read access to the map, the outer one with your super index, and then the inner, in, the inner value that you get back, that's the mutex, you lock that, and so you can move the lock to be as close as possible to where you're actually storing your data um, so that you don't have to needlessly lock. And it means that there's something called lock congestion where if you have lots of different threads that are all trying to access the same lock, that is going to slow down all of those threads because you're going to spend a lot of time waiting for the lock to be freed, um, et cetera. So this is a good pattern if, you're, uh, if you have some kind of map data structure um, and uh, want to be a bit clever about your locks. How about not having any locks? Um, well, as Paris learned from this bridge, lock-free algorithms um, can have some advantages, um, especially because we have atomic operations. We can make changes to memory locations and understand if something in the meantime has beaten us to it, so to speak. So um, this, again, is a bit of a rabbit hole, so I'm going to gloss over some things, uh, and I'm going to simplify some of the algorithms that I'll show you here, and also, you don't have to implement these yourself, there's crates, and I will uh, give some recommendations later. So, first, um, I, I think this is like the hello world of lock-free programming, it's a linked list, um, and a linked list is um, nice to implement for this sort of thing, um, because we have a very, we have a linear structure, this only easily works for um, uh, singly linked lists, um, so we have an easy structure, we have a linear structure, and we only have, or have one pointer from one node to the other node. And so because we only have a single pointer between them, uh, we can do a compare exchange on them. 
Um, and obviously, if the compare exchange operation fails, then we need to redo the operation until it succeeds, or we need to rethink uh, whatever we just wanted to insert. So uh, let's say we have this linked list. Uh, it ends at bar, but maybe it's a bit longer. And so we have foo and bar. And we would really like to insert bonk in between those. So first of all, we just allocate a new node. That can be quite costly. It can be quite slow. We don't have to bother the actual underlying data structure with anything yet. We just allocate that node. We put it somewhere nice. Um, then we fill in the next pointer. We fill in the pointer that is going to point to the, so we want to insert it between foo and bar, and we're going to insert uh, the, the pointer that points at the next element. And now we do a compare exchange on that pointer. If that pointer has changed, so if, if this operation fails, then it means that bar is no longer the next element. It means that maybe bar has been deallocated, or it means that maybe something else has already inserted something else. And with, in which case, we also need to redo this pointer. So we would then go, OK, well, what is the new pointer then? Um, figure out, do we want to be here, or do we want to be after the element that was just inserted? This is one, another of those corner cases that you have to handle, otherwise your data structure breaks. Um, and so based on what the next actual element is, we again fill in this pointer and do another compare and swap. And we do this in a loop until it succeeds. Um, and so finally, hopefully, uh, we have this linked list where it goes foo, and then bonk, and then bar. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, you can also do, do this with trees, and here I'm going to gloss over even more corner cases because trees have more pointers and more levels, and it's generally harder to reason about trees than just a single linked list. Um, but it's the same principle. So again, we have two tree nodes, foo and bar, and they have multiple pointers. So uh, this is a binary tree. Uh, you could either insert into the left bucket, into the right bucket. Uh, you could generalize this for as many buckets as you want, uh, if you so dare. Um, again, you allocate the uh, new node, bonk, uh, just on the heap previously, um, without bothering the data structure on, uh, that, that's backing it, because again, allocations are kind of slow, in comparison to this anyway. Um, we fill in the next pointer should seem familiar. And then again, we do a compare and swap on the foo pointer to bar. If bar has changed, if it no longer exists, etc., we go away and rethink our life. Um, otherwise, we just take that pointer and we point at bonk. And now we just inserted um, a, another element into this very crooked tree. Cool. Um, something else to consider here is um, how do you do in-place mutability? Well, so currently we've sort of just allocated a node and uh, we can't really change it afterwards. So it's sort of copy on write. If you wanted to replace it, you would have to allocate a completely new node and then swap it in and place. And you, com you could compare this. You could then put inside those nodes some kind of mutex to say, well, so we manage the structure of our tree with a lock-free algorithm because it means that we can have as many readers and writers operating on the same structure at the same time. But then internally, when we want to swap out the data that is represented in those nodes, you can still use a mutex as interior mutability, uh, or you can use something slightly different like a ref cell or something like that. So. Um, yeah, in-place in mutability is, uh, is, is something that you can go for. And again, you have to handle a bunch of corner cases about um, you will still at some point get congestion on some of the nodes if they're important. Um, but it's going to be significantly less congestion than if you lock the entire tree. Or even then if you partition your tree previously and you have a bunch of super indices um, that then go into subtrees. Um, Something that I uh, completely glossed over is memory management here. Um, so uh, we actually have a bit of a problem uh, with, let me go back. Um, if we delete one of the nodes, we might still have things that are referring to them. Um, and especially in lock-free systems where we are only really guaranteed that a single operation can be atomic, as soon as you have to update two pointers, it's not going to be atomic anymore because you're doing two atomic operations and something could happen between those atomic operations. You could have picked the wrong memory ordering and something is going to happen between those two operations whether you want to or not. So in a memory, memory, memory management, there's a few different approaches that you can take. The first one is, and the easiest is copy on write, um, and that's 
actually what I usually do because I don't generally tend to mutate my data in place very much. I initialize a bunch of data and I add things to it, but I very rarely take something and then change it in place or want to change it in place. And it also means that if you remove something from the tree, uh, the data, if it is still being owned by some kind of reader, is still accessible. Um, so if we have the tree, uh, we remove a node from it, um, that arc is going to go away, but anyone who still has some kind of copy of it still has access to it, and then when they go out of scope, you're going to clean up the data. And it's then their responsib responsibility to clean up the data. And that's actually kind of nice, because cleaning up data can be sometimes as costly as allocating it. So when we don't have to worry about whether we're going to clean up the data when we're doing an insert, it means that our insertion time is going to be consistent and not then go, oh, now we have to free uh, you know, 20 gigabytes of RAM. So that's, that's something to consider there as well. Um, the, there's a few other mechanisms to do this. One of them is called hazard pointers. Um, I think this was a patent in 2002. Um, and I think it was abandoned, though, because I've seen open implementations of this. Um, otherwise, you know, maybe they're breaking the patent. Um, the idea is that you, you also defer the deletion to later. This is a theme. Um, and when you, when you read a node, you put that node's pointer on the naughty list, so to speak. So the dangerous pointers list that are not allowed to be cleared. And it's a kind of way to keep track of who is still reading uh, a particular memory location. You can have memory locations in there. It's, it's essentially like having a reference counter, but it's a big list. Um, and then when, you, uh, when a thread wants to delete memory, either when it is done with a write or you have some sort of consolidation thread in the background that just goes through your data structure once in a while and cleans up all the nodes that are being marked for deletion, um, it doesn't delete those nodes that are still on the dangerous pointer list. Um, yeah, uh, there's a crate for this in, in Rust that I'm going to show um, later. Um, the last, well, not the last, but um, uh, another, another mechanism for, uh, for reclaiming memory only when it's valid uh, to do so is called epoch-based reclamation. Now, um, this is, again, a bit of a rabbit hole. Um, I tried reading the PhD thesis that introduced this, and it was very boring. Um, but basically... <laughs> You have some kind of global epoch counter, and it can be either 0, 1, or 2. So it's an X modulo 3. And then you have a list of nodes that are supposed to be deleted for every epoch. Um, and you have a flag in every thread, whether it is currently active. So active meaning it is accessing our data structure, it is trying to read something, it is trying to write something, something like that. A thread is actively working on our data structure. Um, and finally, we need an epoch counter for every thread. So what happens when we read or write in this data structure? So if we, if we read, it's pretty simple. Um, writing, you have to handle a few corner cases again because you might be deleting some nodes and then you have to do a bunch of stuff that will touch on in a second. When you read or when you access the memory in any way, you set yourself, the thread sets itself to active and then can read some data and it'll enjoy that data, and it'll be nice. Um, when something is trying to delete a node, when a thread is trying to delete a node, instead of uh, deleting that node immediately, it puts it into the garbage heap for the current epoch. So, meaning that if we're currently in epoch two, then, um, uh, and we delete a node, then we put, we, we're keeping a list of everything that should be deleted for every epoch, we put that thing in there. And then we don't do anything with it. We return, we go about our day knowing that it will eventually be deleted and will not bother us anymore. Um, finally, when we are uh, at the end of our operation, we actually, every thread tries to delete something, and it does so by looking at all the other active threads and looking at their epoch count. And if there's no more threads that are in the epoch count current, or minus one, then we can delete everything. So if basically no threads are still active from two epochs ago, we can delete everything from two epochs ago because we now know that no active thread is still holding any reference to it. And so what this does 
is you have these three buckets that get reshuffled all the time with all the operations. You don't need uh, like a special thread that goes and cleans up the memory. You can do it sort of in line, which spreads out your costs. Spreading out costs is really good when you're, when you're doing things across multiple threads because you don't want to have random like spikes where some operation uh, completes in a nanosecond and the next one takes a millisecond. That's that would be bonkers. So um, spreading it out across multiple threads and spreading it out across all these operations means that it's more consistent. Um, and yeah, so the, just at a, at a glance, um, uh, what you can do with this, I will cover in a second, because let's get back to Ferris. Um, you might just want some crates. You might not want to re-implement this PhD thesis. Um, so uh, what can you personally um, get from this and, and use. So first of all, there's the lock-free crate. Um, the lock-free crate implements a bunch of data structures that are all internally implemented lock-free. Um, it's being fuzzed quite well, it's being tested quite well, and um, it has benchmarks that I forgot to look at. Um, it's... Um, yeah, it implements, it implements um, uh, maps, sets, queues, and stacks, and they all sort of work on the same principle as what I've shown you here with lists and trees, where basically you, uh, you allocate something, and then you s compare, exchange some kind of pointer to that thing, um, and then either it had worked, it worked, or it didn't work, and then you have to redo some of it. Um, and uh, yeah, when you do an insertion here, so it actually implements... Uh, just the normal collection APIs that are being implemented by the standard library, so you can just do an insert and it'll tell you what the previous value was, um, but you should probably be aware of something that has inserted in the meantime, and so there's also this function insert interactive, uh, which gives you the key that you're trying to insert, um, oh, no, it takes the key that you're trying to insert, and then in this closure that you get, I'm realizing that you can't see my highlight. Um, the, uh, the key that you, you get in here uh, in your closure is what you're trying to insert. This is the value that you're, you are putting in, and this is the previous value um, that was in there. And then you can sort of decide, is this what I was expecting it to be? Is it not what I was expecting it to be? And then based on what you were expecting, nope. Uh, <laughs> Um, you uh, return this preview object, which then either says, yes, please put this new thing in, or no, abort the operation, or just throw everything away. Like, that's also a possibility that you can return here. It's like, I didn't like what was in there, so please just delete the entire key. Um, right. Next up, Atombox. So Atombox is a crate that implements hazard pointers, um, and it does so by giving you, it's basically like a, a bit of a wrapper for uh, working with atomic pointers, um, and it, it allocates them in a box and puts them on a heap, and it does all the hazard pointer shenanigans, um, and uh, it basically exposes this, uh, the same API as atomic pointer, so you can swap, you can compare and swap, you can compare and swap weak. I actually didn't mention this. Compare and swap weak, if you're wondering what that does, is that it's allowed to spuriously fail. So compare exchange is guaranteed to, if the value that you've given it is actually the value that was underneath the, on the, in the memory, it is going to succeed. Compare exchange weak is going to sometimes just fail because another operation had a higher priority, for example, a normal compare exchange. Um, and so the rule is that if you're doing a compare exchange in a loop, you should use a compare exchange weak because you're already retrying it, whereas the compare exchange in the hardware is doing the loop for you. Uh, and it's a bit rude to do a compare exchange in a loop because you basically end up with nested loops in the hardware. Anyway, Atom Pointer, it's a great crate if you uh, just want some uh, atomic pointer to something that you can swap in and out. You need some kind of mutable memory location, and you don't otherwise want to really worry about what you're doing uh, you have mutable, internal mutability. You can do in-place mutations um, without having to worry about the memory implications. And finally, I wrote one of these crates. Um, I said I already, uh, I, I mostly write copy and write data structures, and so my crate um, just uses arcs internally. So when you get a reference to something, it's uh, an arc with a bunch of metadata attached to it. And then when you do a compare exchange, you give it your previous reference, um, and then you give it some new data, and then if the compare exchange succeeds, um, it will, uh, it, it gives you the old data, or it gives you the same value back. Um, so, 
Finally, um, I mentioned cross. Uh, no, I meant to mentioned epoch-based garbage reclamation, which is a mouthful. Um, so there's the cross-beam crates that are very, very good. Um, uh, they implement all sorts of different concurrency uh, primitives. They implement um, unsafe cells for memory access. They implement queues, and they implement this. Uh, epoch garbage queue system, so um, a way to keep track of garbage heaps and then also having a collector interface where you can then reclaim memory when it is safe to reclaim it. Um, so, if you are uh, the kind of person who likes implementing things from scratch because yak shaving is really, really fun, um, uh, check out the crossbeam crates if you don't already know them anyway. Um, so, uh, another thing, Wow, this is kind of weird. Anyway, maybe you don't need global accessible state. Um, I, the upcoming slide tells me that it's maybe you don't need global accessible state, but this is the actual slide. There's another pattern that you can use here um, when you're doing sort of concurrent programming, and it's the pr producer-consumer pattern. Um, oh, actually, it was that order. Never mind. Um, so channels are a great way to share data between different parts of your application without actually needing to do any like global synchronization. Uh, it avoids the congestion around locks. It avoids all the headache and, and uh, potential corner cases that you have to handle for lock-free data structures. And it essentially it uses atomics under the hood, um, but it makes your scope much smaller. Instead of having potentially a hundred threads that try to access the same memory location, you only have, say, 10 of them. And then between those, you, you have some that put something into the channel, and you have, something that, you have some that take something out of the channel again. Um, and it just makes, the, it makes your worldview a lot simpler, because you basically just construct a pipe between two points in your program. Um, and honestly, I would say that 90% of my uh, I need to share data between different parts of my application are solved with channels. They also give you nice wake-up properties when you're doing async development because you can await on the receiving of uh, the channel, and then when something puts something in the channel, your future is going to be woken up. Um, uh, if you're doing async development, you might know how much of a pain that can be. Anyway, in summary, this is again one of my pictures. Um, concurrency is very difficult, um, and uh, it's maybe a little bit unfortunate that we have to do it because computers are not getting any faster. At the same time, um, I think these problems are really interesting, um, and they're even, <laughs> even though the performance gains that you can get are sometimes very limited, so there's Amdahl's law, which is a formula to calculate how much your program is actually going to speed up based on doing things in parallel, and spoiler alert, it's usually way less than you would hope for. Um, it still means that we can use the resources that we're giving more effectively, and especially if you're starting to do things across multiple computers, um, then, I mean, obviously these data structures are kind of useless because you don't have atomic operations between different computers, but it's the same problem space, and it's, I, I find it very interesting to think about. If you want to learn more about any of this, I really recommend these two books. I um, read like half of each uh, in preparation for this talk. Um, the art of multiprocessor programming is a lot more low level than uh, designing data intensive, dis intensive application, which is more about uh, building databases, basically, if you wanted to build a database. Um, maybe that's your hobby. Anyway, um, thank you very much. Uh, again, you can hire me as a contractor. Um, I do NixOS and Rust workshops as well. Um, and if you are or your company is interested, um, please email me. And finally, uh, thank you for your attention. And do you have any questions? Actually, that was just on time. Wow. Pretty impressive. Hello. Um, thank you very much for your talk, Katharina. We have time for one question. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oops. So make it a good one. <laughs> no pressure. Oh. Huh. <laughs> Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering where is it? I, I don't know what the proper term for this is, but is it eventually consistent data structures? Where do they fit into this design eventually, space? Mm, eventually, consistent data structures are 
um, in a way the atomics of network distributed systems where you make a bunch of assumptions about what the other nodes in your network are doing and you send these deltas around and through magic, essentially, um, you eventually arrive at the same solution. Um, that's also sort of how um, uh, uh, Raft and Paxos, um, the term escapes me for the class of algorithms. Um, yeah, consensus algorithms, thank you whoever said that. So that's fundamentally also how consensus algorithms work, where you make a bunch of assumptions about, you, you just sort of go, well, this is what I would like to do, and then everyone sort of corrects you if you're wrong. Uh, and collectively, depending on who's more or less wrong, then gets to be correct. And so eventually you're going to reach a stable state. All right, cool, thanks. Um, the next talk in this room takes place at 3.45 p.m. called Rust in Rhyme. So once again, do one final round of applause for Katharina Faye. <laughs> <laughs>